on this presentation by Dr. Leisha. He has been with us since November 2019. Uh, practicing mainly out of St. Thomas Rutherford. He's one of our uh, new star uh, interventional cardiologists. He's quickly uh, gained a reputation as uh, a really forward thinking interventional cardiologist. He's uh, very active in the practice, uh, very active participant in our, our CAF conference. Um, he's completed his uh, uh, undergraduate medicine training in uh, Beirut before completing a residency and uh, cardiovascular fellowship at Robert Wood Johnson in New Jersey, and then completing his uh, interventional fellowship at Robert Wood Johnson as well. So he's gonna speak with us today about some of the new uh, techniques in uh, interventional cardiology and mechanical support. And uh, uh, again, Javier, I appreciate you doing this. And I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Thanks Very so much. Good you. It's a big pleasure and honor to present today. I uh, feel free to interrupt me anytime and use the chat option to ask any questions. Uh, I'd love the interaction. That that's what makes it fun. I understand the audience is a mix of internal medicine, cardiology, and interventional cardiology. So I'm going to try to make it as balanced as possible. Uh, disclosures: I'm a consultant to Philips BD and Abbott Medical. Now, the outline of the talk is going to start with a large component of coronary physiology and imaging so that you can understand the cath reports that uh, come out these days, interventional coronary therapy, coronary therapy especially atherectomy, the multiple uh, methods of atherectomy, cardiogenic shock, interventional therapy, specifically mechanical circulatory support, and the new definition of cardiogenic shock. I'm going to serve very quickly through endovascular arterial interventions and endovascular venous interventions, but this will be the minority of the talk. Let's go to the meat of the talk, which is coronary physiology. So uh, this is mostly for the internal medicine and the audience. Uh, FFR, you've seen it in a lot of interventional report. This is what was called fractional flow reserve, which means that we measure the hemodynamic significance of a coronary lesion that looks moderate from 50 to 70%, we wire that lesion. There's a sensor at the tip of this wire that will allow us to measure the pressure distal to the lesion and the pressure proximal to the lesion. And based on that ratio, we do it at rest. Then we give adenosine to dilate the heart arteries as much as possible. And that would allow us to see what's the ratio between the rest and uh, after hyper I have a hyperemic stress, an FFR of 0.8 or less means that the lesion is significant that requires help. Why is this important? Because we cannot just eyeball lesions, especially if they're in the moderate range, and decide to stent them. There are downsides to stenting and lesions which do, do not need it. So uh, a decision-making based on physiological uh, data is more cost-effective, leads to better clinical outcomes, and leads to unnecessary, uh, and prevents unnecessary PCI. Now, you've seen FFR in the past. In the last five years, there's a huge number of indices that showed up in our world, and I'd love for you to be familiar with those in case you see them on the CAT reports. The uh, FFR is on the left of the screen is during hyperemia, meaning we give IV or intracoronary adenosine, and we measure the flow and the pressures before and after. Now, nowadays we have uh, indices that measure the hemodynamics without adenosine, which makes it much more simple, much less comfortable for the pa much more comfortable for the patient, and much faster. The one that's used the most is on the right of the screen, uh, the IFR. This is instantaneous wave-free ratio, which measures the ratio of diastolic flow between the uh, uh, wire sensor distal to the lesion and proximal to the lesion. But there are other uh, indices like DPR, DFR that we're gonna talk to about in detail in the next few slides. There's whole cycle and diastolic cycle. As all of you know, most of the coronary perfusion happens in diastole and that's why most of the indices concentrate on diastole. But recently we have evidence to show that some of the whole cycle systole and diastole ra ratio, including specifically RFR is as equivalent. So what's IFR? You've seen it a lot. This is the ratio of the pressure at the pressure sensor distal to the lesion to the pressure in the guiding catheter. Uh, 
So the difference in pressure, if it's less than 0 0.89 ratio, indicates that the lesion is hemodynamically significant and requires help. Now, the nowadays, not only we can spot IFR, meaning no one lesion at a time, we can have an entire coronary map of the physiology of a lesion. Uh, why does that make sense? Because if we have multiple serial lesions, like in diabetic patients, stenting one physiologically significant lesion most of the time does not help the patient because it's a gradual rise in the pressure. Whether when we do the physiologic map, like you see here, the number of dots on the angi angiogram indicates the amount of pressure drop across that lesion. You see on the left, uh, left side of the screen, there's a huge number of dots in the proximal right coronary artery versus on the right side of the screen where the dots are kind of distributed throughout. This definitely affects management. Like the lesion on the right here with focal disease, if we go ahead and stent it, the patient feels much better. Whether uh, if we do the pullback IFR on the left, diffuse disease, we don't really see that much difference in clinical outcomes. That's why physiology is so important for interventional management. What are the other non-hyperemic pressure ratios? DPR is another company, OpSense makes that, that measures the ratio throughout the entire diastolic phase rather than the wave-free period. Some subtle differences, but they're equivalent in clinical practice. If you see DFR, that's from a different company, Boston Scientific, that also measures the ratios in diastole across the lesion. RFR is something also um, by, made by Abbott, another company that measures the biggest uh, difference in pressure throughout systole and diastole. Now, long story short, that's a kind of an al alphabet soup of letters, but I want you to know that all these indices at, uh, are equivalent. FFR cutoff is 0 0.8, and all the other indices cutoff is 0 0.89. Not to remember the numbers, but if you see that on reports, that's what it means. And this has been confirmed to be equivalent in multiple studies. Now, what's happening in the invasive cardiology world, we're trying to make it even more simple. Uh, companies are investing in technologies that are fascinating. Instead of uh, putting a wire inside a coronary and measuring blood flow, now we have the ability to do a coronary angiogram and based on the flow dynamics on the screen without a wire, without adenosine, we are able to assess the physiological significance of some moderate angiographic lesions. And this is what's gonna show up in the next slide, which is what we call QFR. It is not uh, in clinical practice yet. It is developing very quickly. No wire, no adenosine, two orthogonal views of the same coronary artery. And then through computational dynamics, the flow is calculated and you have a map of the physiological significance throughout the entire artery, which is very exciting. That's definitely the future. That's another company called, uh, who makes a virtual FFR. You can see the kind of the mouse rolling through the vessel. And this is the value of the FFR as you go down the vessel. So uh, no need for wire. Obviously this is not prime time, but it will happen in the next few years, which makes it better for patients. And we're going even less invasive than that. Heart flow is available to us. This is coronary CT and geography that all of us order on frequent basis. There's a company that takes all that data and uh, uh, analyzes that and uh, puts it in computa computational dynamics of flow that allow us to have an entire hemodynamic map of the coronary tree. So not only in, by invasive measures, but also non-invasive measures, we are able to have a map of the tree. Now, all of what we talked about is epicardial coronaries, the arteries that run on the surface of the heart. That, interestingly, constitutes 5 to 10% of myocardial circulation, 90 to 95%. That's a humongous number of myocardial circulation happens in the microcirculatory world, including the pre-arterioles, arterioles, and capillaries. And there's a huge component of that that causes chest pain that we cannot detect on daily basis with today's tools. All of us, I'm sure, in internal medicine, cardiology, interventional cardiology, have taken care of these patients on daily basis. Typical angina, you could bet your house that they're going to have coronary disease. Uh, 
they have ischemia that's very, very evident on non-invasive testing. They go to the cath lab, lo and behold, that coronary arteries are normal. Go home, it's in your head, there's no cardiac problem, it may be your stomach. And this, interestingly, constitutes 40% of NCDR patients. This is the uh, most of the patients included in the registry of the American College of Cardiology. 40% of patients have this situation where they have normal arteries, but they have angina. Well, it turns out that 30 to 50% of those patients, which constitutes about 15 to 20% of the entire patient population, has ischemia, myocardial ischemia, from a microcirculatory etiology. So how do we diagnose that? There are, so let's talk about that new term called ENOCA, ENOCA, ischemia with non-obstructive coronary arteries. You're going to see more of that in the literature soon. It's the combination of typical anginal symptoms with the three typical characteristics, objective evidence of ischemia, non-invasive ischemic testing, no evidence of epicardial obstructive coronary artery disease, and evidence of coronary flow reserve or uh, index of microcirculatory resistance abnormalities with the test that I'm going to be talking about in the next few slides. So whenever there's discrepancy between your clinical suspicion and the coronary findings, think about that in the patients who do have risk factors, and we'll talk about that. So you, uh, a patient comes in with po possible coronary problems. You take them to the lab. They get an invasive angiogram. They do not have have epicardial obstructive coronary artery disease. This is where we start thinking about, is this a vasospastic epicardial angina, which can be induced by certain protocols, versus microvascular angina in the microcirculation, versus a combination of both, which is pretty frequent. How do we actually diagnose that with something called CFR and IMR? Now, what are those? So why the, but before I get to CFR and IMR, why is this important? Uh, it's not important to just kind of be academically interesting. That it does affect patient management. All these patients would benefit from all the non-pharmacological lifestyle interventions that we talk about every day, like holding smoking, weight management, exercise, and nutrition, which has a humongous effect on a microcirculatory dysfunction in the heart. Even without any medicines, those interventions lead to significant decrease in the anginal frequency. And of course, management of the usual risk factors, hypertension, dyslipidemia, and diabetes. But in terms of medications that target this uh, entity, all these patients, without any exceptions, have been shown to benefit from statin therapy through its pleiotropic anti-inflammatory effect and ACE inhibitors through their multiple mechanisms. Now, if someone is diagnosed with vasospastic angina, this is where the coronary testing affects clinical management. If we are able to distinguish between those two, the patient will benefit tremendously because they'll have significant clinical improvement on dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers and long-acting nitrates uh, and nicorandil, which is available in Europe, not in the United States. Now, if the patient is diagnosed with microvascular angina based on CFR and IMR, this is where you want to decrease the amount of metabolism of the heart as much as possible. How do we do that? Beta blockers, non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers like deltazem, verapamil, ranolazine, and ivabradine have off-label uses for that by improving the metabolism of the heart to deal with more myocardial ischemia. And there's a, a agent that's used frequently in Europe called trimetazidine that's not available in the U.S. that changes the metabolism of the heart from the beta oxidation of the fatty acids to the glucose metabolism, which is much more efficient and requires much less oxygen. Now, the physiological indices that I talked to you about in the previous slides are, in the, are actually a study of the epicardial circulation, which constitutes 10% of the heart circulation. CFR, or coronary flow reserve, evaluates the entire coronary anatomy from top to bottom, from the epicardials to the microcirculation. IMR, on the other hand, only evaluates microcirculatory disease. Now, what is CFR? 
CFR is the ability of the coronary arteries to dilate and increase flow with maximal hyperemia, with a maximal vasodilator. It's the ratio of the flow with maximal dilation over the flow at rest, as you see in this. How do we measure it? There are two ways. There's a Doppler way, which is a catheter that has a Doppler uh, sensor on it that measures the velocity through that, which is bulky, old, difficult to deliver. Nowadays, the most efficient way to get CFR is through an injection of three cc's of normal saline at room temperature. That's as easy as it gets. So an interventionist would place a wire in the heart artery. That wire has two sensors, temperature sensors. And when you inject the three cc of normal saline at no normal temperature, the temperature drops on the first sensor, then it drops on the second sensor. Depending on the blood flow through the heart, the, the time, the, what we call the mean transit time between the peaks of those two temperature drops will indicate flow. And flow equals volume over time. And CFR is the ratio of flow at maximal hyperemia with adenosine over the flow at rest. So we are able to, within seconds, to detect CFR in the coronary anatomy by injecting three times saline and averaging those numbers. And as you see here, flow equals uh, volume divided by mean time. And CFR is the ratio of flow at hyperemia over flow at rest, which uh, is reduced to the um, uh, ratio of mean transit time at rest over hyperemia by eliminating the volume in the numerator. And that's how very quickly in the cath lab we are able to determine coronary flow oh. reserve. Now, what is IMR? How does that help too? IMR is, as, as we said, specific to the microcirculation. IMR is index of microcirculatory resistance. Basically, we're measuring the resistance of all these capillaries and arterioles. What is resistance according to Ohm's law? It's a difference in pressure divided by flow. Since the venous pressure is so small, it's basically the arterial pressure divided by flow. And we do have a way to detect arterial pressure in the coronary with a flow wire. We place a wire in the distal LED, we detect that pressure, and then we do the injections of saline, which will allow us to evaluate flow. And pressure times the mean transit time equals IMR. IMR more than 25 is abnormal. Less than 25 is normal. So this is the cutoff. Of course, it's a spectrum to take into consideration in some patients, but 25 is the number to remember, and the abnormality in CFR is two. So that scenario happens all the time, coronary angiography, you do the epicardial coronary angiography, then you find out about moderate coronary lesions, you do an FFR and it's normal, more than 0 0.8. At this point, you're thinking, this patient has typical angina, I'm 100% sure, I've seen ST depressions on the, EKG stress test, I've seen nuclear perfusion defects or MRI. Then you move on to the microcirculatory evaluation, which takes literally five minutes. And that would let us know if the CFR and IMR are normal or abnormal to diagnose the patient. Why is that important? It is because number one, th those patients are super frustrated. They've been in the ER multiple times. They've had five casts in the last three years. They have no diagnosis and uh, they've been told it's in their head or their stomach and they're not getting any results. Going by the therapeutic um, principles that I exposed in the previous slides, those patients would definitely get better if you identify them. Now, moving on to intracoronary imaging, intravascular ultrasound has been shown over the last five years to improve clinical outcomes. Intravascular ultrasound is a catheter that does have an ultrasound probe at the tip of it that will allow us to evaluate the coronary anatomy in very much detail, not for academic purposes, but again, it does affect the, what, how we treat the coronary arteries when we see that. And the ultimate trial is the most famous trial that showed at three-year outcomes a, a big difference in MACE, major adverse uh, cardiovascular events. 10% versus 6% based on intravascular ultrasound findings. Basically, when we place a stent, when we make sure that the expansion is satisfactory with certain criteria, there's no stent edge dissection and there's no significant plaque burden uh, 
at the uh, diff approximal distal edge of the stent, that means that the patient is going to have a very good long-term outcome. Other studies, as you see above also, definitely showed a significant clinical improvement with the use of intravascular imaging. It's not the only way. There's another way to look inside the coronary arteries. It's called OCT, optical coherence tomography. This is based on infrared light rather than ultrasound waves. And as you see, the resolution is phenomenal. It lets you even differentiate between the intima media and the adventitia, allow us to look at the external elastic lamina, which is the target for adequate uh, vessel sizing for stent placement and long-term good outcomes. What's the difference? You can see the difference here. The ultrasound on the right, you see calcium here. The ultrasound wave hit the calcium and come back to the, tra to the transmitter and you see a big shadow behind it. Uh, OCT is able to look at calcium in much more detail. It allows us to see the periphery if it's nodular versus superficial versus deep. Why is that important? Again, not for the beauty of images, but it does affect the way we treat these lesions in the cath lab. So superficial calcium, like you see here on the left of the screen, is treated with atherectomy, and I'll show you what that is, but versus the deep calcium is usually treated with non-compliant balloons, scoring balloons, cutting balloons, or newly intravascular lithoplasty. So the, when we look at the vessel, this makes a huge difference on how we manage these lesions, which will translate into long-term clinical outcomes. Uh, not only calcium, but if we look at a lesion like here with a huge amount of lipids, it's mostly a fibro fatty lesion, we go straight for a stent. We don't pre it so we don't shower and cheese that lipids through the stent struts down into the peripheral circulation. If we see a lot of fibrosis, like an instant restenosis, we use compliant balloon and non-compliant balloons. If we see calcium, we choose between atherectomy or non-compliant slash cutting balloons, depending on the location and extent of calcium. So this video that you see is not science fiction. This is, it has been on the market for the last three years. It's been there since 2017. We use it in complex coronary interventions. Whenever we have multiple stents to be placed, we are able to literally walk into the coronary vessel like a big cave, looking at all the stent struts and making sure that the stents are well expanded and well opposed, because this does uh, affect long-term outcomes on complex coronary bifurcation interventions. Let's move on to interventional coronary therapies. What's new or not so new, but adopted lately? In the last five years, we have seen a major increase in rotational and orbital atherectomy in the United States. One of the most used atherectomy is rotational atherectomy. You can see this is like a bullet-shaped, diamond-tipped uh, device that rotates at 150 to 180,000 RPMs. You see the operator on the bottom moving the cursor back and forth into the artery with a kind of pecking motion to try to uh, get through the calcium and sand that calcium lesion in order to allow for adequate improvement of the vessel compliance and uh, stent placement. This is a competitive technology called orbital atherectomy where it uh, does that sideways instead of cutting forward. This uh, is also a diamond tipped uh, burr that rotates at about 80,000 to 120,000 RPMs and sends the calcium into small particulates smaller than the right blood cells that allow to be the microcirculation to get rid of them and for stent placement adequately. It, is do, it has different techniques, uh, different operators have different pref preferences based on anatomy, but both of them are extremely uh, effective. Laser atherectomy is used in uh, different situations, a lot of calcium, instant restenosis, um, and it works through three mechanisms, photomechanical, photothermal, and photochemical mechanisms, where basically it vaporizes the ather atheromatous tissue and calcium. Uh, and uh, there is an off-label indication for, not an off-label use of laser with contrast, which induces basically explosion of small bubbles in the coronary that would 
allow the vessel to expand and for advanced therapies to be applied if everything else fails. Now, the new kid on the block is intravascular lithotripsy, which we're all excited about. <clears throat> this is a balloon that has emitters that send sound waves through the balloon itself into the vessel wall. And as you see, at two atmospheres, three atmospheres, which is extremely low pressure in the coronaries, is able to crack the calcium and send those sound waves through it. This is available in, now in the United States in coronary and peripheral vasculature. And I'm going to show you, uh, notice the sounds here of the emitters. So it does that sequentially, and it literally breaks the calcium. And notice on the uh, video below, someone is putting their fingers at the emitters, and nothing happens. So it has differential effect on heart tissue versus soft tissue. It doesn't do anything to soft tissue. So it doesn't cause major trauma, but it does break heart tissue. Uh, the studies have shown zero perforations, zero embolization, and it's a very safe technology that is very promising. Now, brachytherapy, Dr. Um, Kerrigan and uh, Dr. Um, uh, Eli Elias Haddad have developed this um, in our system. This is an extremely effective technology for instant restenosis, especially recurrent instant restenosis, and we have it now available, uh, fortunately, for patients who are desperate with multiple layers of stents that have failed everything. And this study uh, out of Mount Sinai in New York showed a significant difference in outcomes between brachytherapy and, diff and additional stenting or angioplasty with a significant decrease in MACE events at one year. And a recent meta-analysis that put five trials together showed a 26% target vascular revascularization at two years, which is excellent for these high-risk patients. What's missing in the United States is coronary drug-coated balloons, which we have it in the peripheral circulation. But uh, those are very promising in two to three layer instant restenosis, which is becoming much more frequent these days, uh, as you know, and it showed superiority over drug loading stents in taking care of multiple layers instant restenosis. Let's move on to cardiogenic shock therapies. So I thought I would address cardiogenic shock with four different questions. Number one, what is cardiogenic shock? How do we diagnose this? How do we evaluate the severity of it? And uh, once we evaluate the shock and its severity, is it LV dominant, RV dominant, or biventricular? Then we move on to how do we treat it with mechanical circulatory support options. First definition, what is cardiogenic shock? This cannot be done without a pulmonary artery catheter, hence the need for right heart cath in these patients. Uh, it's defined by a systolic blood pressure less than 90 for more than 30 minutes, not responsive to fluid administration with evidence of cardiac dysfunction and a, a documented cardiac index less than 2.2 liters per minute per meter square and an elevated wedge pressure. Now, our Society of Cardiovascular Angiography and Interventions has unified the language around cardiogenic shock because it was all over the place and suggested this new terminology of sky cardiogenic shock from A to E, uh, A being at risk for cardiogenic shock, B beginning, C, classic, D, deteriorating, and E, extremis. Of course, this relies on specific physical examination findings of hypoperfusion and congestion, biochemical markers of lactate, creatinine, liver enzymes, and hemodynamics with uh, pressures on your swan catheter to make the diagnosis. I'm not going to go into the details of that. Uh, you're welcome to have the slides to that, but it is basically straightforward, and that allows us to communicate about this. Why is it important? Because it correlates with clinical outcomes. A cardiogenic shock class sky class E will do way, way worse than a class B, and it has been proven. Now, cardiac arrest, whenever it happens, even if it's on class uh, stage B, if someone has cardiac arrest, this is a huge implication to the prognosis. So, Whenever patients arrest, this puts them in a whole different category, and it's a modifier on this uh, classification that has to be taken into account. 
right heart cath has resurged. Uh, we trained, well trained in an era where right heart cath was kind of belittled and it showed no differences back in the early 2000s, the 2000s. But there are a lot of um, issues with these trials and there were critiqued and recently we have picked up doing right heart cast on very sick patients because it affects our management. This is a new technique, minimally invasive, done from the anatomical snuff box that we published in Journal of Invasive Cardiology, that uh, less radiation, more convenient for the patient and operator, and saves time. Now, third question. So we saw what's cardiogenic shock? How severe is it on the classification? Then after that, you would have to know, is it left ventricular? right ventricular versus biventricular. There are two indices that are extremely important in the evaluation of these patients when we do a right heart cath. The first one is called CPO, cardiac power output, which is the uh, product of mean arterial pressure times cardiac output divided by a constant of 451. What does that mean? That combines both the inotropy of the heart, the contraction of the heart, and the perfusion in one index, and is an indicator of left ventricular dysfunction. If it's less than 0.6, it's significantly abnormal. PAPI is a pulmonary artery pulsatility index, which is very easily calculated based on the systolic pulmonary artery pressure minus diastolic pulmonary artery pressure divided by the filling pressure, right atrial pressure. If this is less than one, it's significantly abnormal and indicates right ventricular dysfunction. So we'll walk through if, if uh, the CP, we do the right heart cath and very quickly we can come out with these numbers within two, three minutes. See if the CPO is less than 0.6, PAPI is, is more than one, and the filling pressures on the right are normal, but the filling pressures on the left are significantly abnormal. This is left dominant cardiogenic shock, which requires certain uh, mechanical support. On the right side, it's usually the PAPI index that's low, less than one. And of course, the left side will be low because there's no flow going to the left side. And the difference is that the right atrial pressure is now significantly elevated with a wedge pressure that's uh, usually normal. Biventricular pressure is the combination of both. Now, how does that affect cardiogenic shock management? <clears throat> right ventricular shock requires specific um, devices, among which are Impella RP, tandem heart, right atrium to pulmonary artery. We'll detail that in the next few slides. Versus if it's extreme, then move on to VA ECMO, veno arterial exocorporeal membrane or oxygenation. Left ventricular support is usually dealt with in triuric balloon pump, but obviously more recently we're kind of moving on with devices that provide an increase in cardiac output, like an Impella 2.5, Impella CP, Impella 5.0 or 5.5, Tandem Heart, which I will explain uh, later, and an IVAC device that is available in Europe, not in the United States. So this is what the Impella is. This is a percutaneous left ventricular assist device placed over the wire. It's a pigtail catheter that basically aspirates blood from the left ventricle and uh, perfuses the aorta from the outlet cannula. You all have seen that. This is a very effective device. The tandem heart is a device where the operator goes from the groin vein up to the right atrium, crosses the interatrial septum into the left atrium, places a large cannula, which aspirates the blood from the left atrium, basically decompressing the left side of the heart, and basically goes through a pump that throws it into the femoral artery, into the aorta, to perfuse the systemic circulation, uh, including the upper body in a retrograde fashion when the heart is failing. That's also an effective technology. On the right side, Impella RP is a catheter that has the same principle of aspirating blood from the inflow and um, uh, ejecting the blood from the outflow. It's a 22 French pump that gets placed from the femoral vein uh, into the right side of the heart, and it aspirates blood from the inferior vein cava, right atrium, and throws it into the pulmonary artery to help the right heart uh, uh, provide adequate perfusion. Another uh, right ventricular support is the Protect Duo, made uh, by 
uh, tandem life, which is a cannula placed from the internal jugular vein that goes to the pulmonary artery and aspirates, same principle, aspirates blood from the right atrium and uh, uh, ejects the blood into the pulmonary artery to help the right ventricle eject. The advantages of this is the patients can walk uh, with that. It is very convenient and an oxygenator can be added to that with VV ECMO um, if needed. And this is a, a video animation of the placement into the jugular vein. The inflow from the right atrium is connected to the outflow through the pump, and that's how this uh, works. VA ECMO is the ultimate uh, support, but it does increase uh, left, I'm sorry, uh, it does increase left ventricular uh, uh, myocardial oxygen demand. It aspirates blood from the, usually the femoral vein or the internal jugular, passes it through a pump and an oxygenator to replace the heart and lungs, and uh, the outflow is in the femoral artery. So basically, you're bypassing everything. You're giving the patient a new heart and lung, which are external to the body. We're excited about this because the technology has become extremely small and patients can be transferred with such a small device as big as a can of Coke with uh, very easy uh, placement without the help of a perfusionist. Now, how does that, why, why does that uh, help? What are the mechanical support options? I thought this algorithm used by Innova uh, Heart and Vascular in Virginia was extremely helpful. Uh, if someone has left a uh, refractory left dominant shock with the criteria that we just mentioned, we see if the patient is hypoxemic versus not. If they're not hypoxemic, they don't need lung support, then we proceed with Impella CP or Impella 50 percutaneous ventricular assist device. If someone has hypoxemia, they require their lungs to be supported, then it would be either VA ECMO with LV vent or otherwise known as ECPELA or ECMELA and tandem heart or tandem heart with an oxygenator. Right ventricular dominant cardiogenic shock usually requires an Impella RP or PROTECT duo, one of those two, um, depending on different criteria. If someone's hypoxemic, requires an oxygenator, then this is when we Either go for VO, VA ECMO with or without an LV vent uh, or tandem heart with an oxygenator. If the shock is biventricular with all the criteria met, then it's going to be either impella on the left, impella on the right, called bipella, or VA ECMO with LV vent or tandem heart with oxygenator. So it's very important for those patients to make sure the legs are well perfused because we're taking care of the heart, we're focusing on all of that. And meanwhile, the leg can get in, infarcted within days and this will lead to an amputation, which is literally a death sentence uh, in terms of prognosis. So very important to uh, maintain adequate uh, surveillance of the distal flow. One of the techniques that we described last year in CCI is a radial to femoral bypass. Since we use the radio for cardiac cath, we connect that to an anti-grade femoral sheath that perfuses the leg. There are other femoral to femoral bypass techniques, but this one is the least invasive. Now, let's talk about endovascular arterial interventions quickly. Uh, basically, why is that important? You think to yourself, why in the cardiology world we uh, help patients with a leg revascularization because it does improve outcomes, it does um, decrease mortality and enhances patient survival. As you see in this uh, trial uh, published in 2018 on Medicare database patients over four years, an above the knee amputation compared to revascularization made patients may live much longer with much better quality of life. Now, in our mind, uh, vascular interventions means retrograde groin access from the common femoral artery. But these days, we've been using a combination of multiple access sites to be able to tackle very complex diffuse disease, whether antegrade common femoral, retrograde popliteal, retrograde pedal, radial to peripheral, brachial or axillary, and even accessing bypass, uh, external bypass grafts. And these are some examples of antegrade common femoral artery access. This is the groin here. We're going 
in the opposite direction, in the direction of the leg, and we close those with closure devices, we can stick distal thighs into directly into stents when we cannot cross them. We can stick directly into tibial arteries in those uh, patients with isolated infrapopliteal disease without uh, the ability to revascularize from the groin. Uh, it is very frequent to stick the foot in a retrograde fashion to be able to revascularize in a retrograde uh, technique. We stick axillar, axillary to femoral bypass tra uh, uh, tra safely. Uh, the radial to peripheral has picked up and some of the lesions can be taken care of from the radial artery, which has a huge advantage in terms of morbidity, vascular complications, and uh, patient throughput. Axillary has taken over the brachial access for aortoiliac interventions from above. It, it is compressible, it is closable, and it's much safer according to the most recent literature. And even plantar access in extreme cases is doable to be able to revascularize patients and allow them to uh, avoid amputations. The radial to peripheral R2P movement is radial to peripheral movement. There is now a lot of long equipment that allows us to fix legs from the radial artery, and we combine that with pedal access. Why is that important? The patients go home in two hours. They have a little band on their wrist or on their foot, and then they go home. They don't have to lay flat. It's great for patients with back pain and uh, issues with ambulation. Uh, we have published a review article on alternative access site in last year. I welcome you to look at it for specific details if you're interested. Now, what are the atherectomy types of uh, that we use? Uh, very close to coronary atherectomy types. The first one is orbital, which is also a diamond-tipped uh, um, burr that circulates in an orbital fashion at different speeds and shaves the calcium into small, tiny particles that get uh, um, taken up by the microcirculation. There's rotational atherectomy with the jet stream device or the Rotarex device that's new on the market, which is extremely effective, especially in chronic occlusions. This was the amount of clot we extracted the other day with it. Directional atherectomy is basically a blade that shaves the plaque, and you can see the externalized plaque here and laser atherectomy, which vaporizes plaque and calcium and traumas. Moving on to deep vein interventions, there are two major uh, uh, techniques here with the penumbra device or the clot retriever device. You can see how effective those devices have become. Those clots are chronic clots that have a lot of collagen and fibrotic tissue in them. Those devices are able to pull them out without even an incision, just with a puncture through the, the vein. So we're very excited about these new technologies available to us. There's a syndrome called May-Thurner syndrome, which is completely underappreciated, which is the compression of the left common iliac vein by the contralateral common iliac artery crossing over. And this usually compresses the left iliac vein in at least 20% of people, but it is symptomatic in about 10% of those 20%, so almost 1% to 2% of the population. And this frequently leads to DVTs. As you see here, this uh, vein is full of clot from the femoral popliteal segments all the way to the iliac veins. And uh, therapies like the clot retriever and penumbra have been extremely successful in changing this and avoiding thrombolytics and making patients walk overnight. These are usually very young patients, professional, who go back to their jobs right after the procedure. And finally, a uh, word on pulmonary interventions. It's very developed at St. Thomas West uh, with the leadership of Dr. Morse with the PERT team. This has been extremely effective in submassive and massive pulmonary emboli with hemodynamic uh, and imaging uh, features of right ventricular strain. And there are two main uh, technologies, the CAT-12, which is a penumbra aspiration catheter or the flow retriever which is a series of rings that literally pull the clot into a big sheath. And you can see how much clot can be aspirated even in one case. And so this is the end of my presentation. I thought I would give you a quick run over interventional therapies. I uh, thought this one represented kind of the change in perspective that 
I have had personally over the last 10 years in interventional cardiology. I was not trained this way, but I changed my practice to adopt all the new changes. And it's been very refreshing to see the technology move on in this in directions that make us help patients and have excellent long-term outcomes. Thank you very much. Wow, Hadi, that was uh, quite a talk. I'm very impressed and thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you. Um, I, I wonder, is there any vessel, artery or vein that you can't reach in the body? <laughs> Probably the brain. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'll start off with a question. So, so practically speaking, uh, when you're stenting, how often do you use IVIS or optical coherence to assess your stent deployment? So uh, in the large, in my personal practice, I use it in about 70 to 80 percent of the time. Some operators use it 100 percent of the time, but uh, they're at the extreme level of the spectrum. They're visionaries, but the large majority of operators in the United States use it less than 5 percent of the time. And uh, this culture is changing because now we are having clinical outcomes data that show the difference in instant restenosis, target vessel failure, and the recurrent presentations for ischemic heart disease. So uh, placing a stand and making sure that it's a very well-sized uh, stent, well-opposed, well-expanded, will translate into patient never coming back to the cath lab for that lesion again in a very rare of course, not never, but in a very small amount, less than 2%. That's, that's also impressive. Um, I'm going to share a chat question that Jimmy Kerrigan posted earlier. He was talking about uh, spasm provocation. Do you prefer methyl or gonavine or acetylcholine? Yeah, so these are two completely different uh, tests. Methyl or gonavine uh, tests uh, vasospastic angina in the epicardial coronaries which is an endothelial independent mechanism. Acetylcholine tests microvascular vasospasm with an endothelial dependent mechanism through nitric oxide. So what does that mean? Uh, there are the typical Prince metal angina that all of us identify that have been documented to have the elevations on Holter monitors or uh, during regular monitoring. Those are the patients that are induced by methyl ergonavine. The microvascular vasospastic angina is the usually the uh, type 2 diabetic patients, obese, sedentary, with normal cor epicardial coronaries or non-obstructive epicardial coronaries that do have typical angina with documentation of uh, ischemia by non-invasive means. And now you're in the lab, you don't have an epicardial coronary lesion. This is the patient that I use acetylcholine on, and I would do the CFR IMR before and after. And that helped. There are now the literature is developing on that. There are subtypes of even this population of structural versus functional uh, microvascular dysfunction. Uh, and uh, those have subtleties in differentiation between CFR and IMR, which I'm not going to go through, but uh, differences in numbers implicate differences in clinical management, and it's very effective. Mm. Hey, this is Mark Zinker. Um, thank you so much for your talk. I really appreciated the coronary physiology of the library, too. Thank I, you. I would like to uh, propose a sort of challenge and a, maybe a question to you. Sure. If you look at the original studies that validated FFR, it was on stress treadmill, dobutamine echo, and stress spec studies, which probably are not the most sensitive nor the most specific studies that we do now. If you look at things like cardiac PET, cardiac stress MRI, and I would agree that you know the FAME trial and others have looked at the prognostic implications of an abnormal FFR, but but if you look at that original validation study, it was mostly people with chronic stable angina without other mitigating factors. So my question to you is, I deal with a lot of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients, and I would challenge that their physiology probably isn't normal like somebody without HCM because they've got increased LVEDP, they have diastolic dysfunction, 
They have outflow track radiants. So I'm always sort of perplexed how reliable an IFR or an FFR is in somebody like that. Do you have any sort of wisdom or comments about that? Yeah, I totally agree with you. And this also happens in the myocardial bridging population too, which yeah. is a different physiology. But both of them, what, what I personally do in those kind of patients, if they're having typical angina, and let's say there's absolutely no coronary uh, lesions or there's a mild 20, 30%, I usually place an IFR wire through it or an FFR wire through it, and I give the patient dobutamine in the cath lab. And that usually induces, if you do have ischemia, you're gonna see that FFR become physiologically significant. So this is kind of an off-label use of a dobutamine induced, but I think it makes physiological sense. Same thing with myocardial uh, bridges. You know, yeah. you come to the lab, they're sedated, they're all cool, and this bridge doesn't look bad. But, you know, when they walking up the steps, uh, the whole thing changes. So that's where dobutamine helps us simulate uh, physiological exercise. And yeah, some health labs like Mayo Clinic and other places have an ergometer where they have patients literally do the bicycle on the cath lab table. Yeah. You know, one other plug I'll have to make is an MRI reader. There was a study done about a year ago published in New England Journal of Medicine called the MRI INFORM trial. And it was a trial looking at patients with chronic stable angina who were cast and were randomized to either FFR or cardiac stress MRI. And actually they found that cardiac stress MRI compared to FFR assessment had the same MACE endpoint, but actually there was less um, less cost in the cardiac MRI group. So I do think if, if we're gonna compare probably apples to apples, it's probably better to compare FFR to something like stress PET or stress MRI, which is a more sensitive marker than would be like stress PECT. 100%, I totally think that in the next few years, we're gonna see less invasive ischemic testing and more stress MRIs and, and PET since it's so sensitive, so specific, and it wasn't obviously prevalent at the time when FFR was being developed in the early 2000s. So this changes the perspective. And I also predict that uh, heart flow CT FFR will also become extremely used, especially now that insurance companies are approving cardiac CT much easier than a few years ago. So those two technologies are going to be very nice, complementary, anatomical, physiological uh, studies that will allow us to do a better job in the cath lab and when we go to the lab our ratio of pci would become much higher than what it is right now so right now let's say it's 25 percent of patients that we cat it will become probably 60 to 70 percent because most of those patients are streamlined through studies that are extremely specific and sensitive thank you for the question thank you any other questions, anyone? All right. Well, um, I really appreciate you doing this. Thank uh, you. It's been a great Grand Rounds. I've learned a lot. I think everyone has. Um, and uh, since we don't have any other questions, we will uh, adjourn. And uh, I hope everyone has a good afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye-bye.